Today we're going to be taking a look at five openings that feature incredibly rare gambits that you have almost certainly never heard of before, or at least I can say for myself personally, I had never heard of a single one of these before I sat down today, so I found five gambits I, I never heard of, I compiled them all into one big compilation, and we're just going to be checking them out together, and there's a lot of interesting things. Now, I will warn you in advance, some of these are very bad and very dubious, but... Some of these might be playable, which is maybe the biggest surprise of all, and it would actually be cool before we jump into it if you let me know in the comments below uh, if you've actually heard of any of these. If you, we go through the list, let me know how many of these you've actually heard, and if you could find it somewhere deep within your heart to subscribe to the channel, it would mean the entire world to me. I really do appreciate everybody that subscribes, but you get the idea. It's five games, five dubious gambits, and we're just jumping in right away with number five. This is something that you can play against D4 and C4, and the way that you get to this gambit is by playing the Budapest Gambit. Now, this one obviously by itself is not rare. It's an incredibly well-known idea. You sacrifice your e5 pawn to play knight to g4, and the usual idea is that you're going to be regaining uh, the e5 pawn with your knight. However, uh, the reason that some of these gambits on this list ended up here is not because they are actually an unusual gambit by themselves, but rather some of these come from popular openings but are a rather rare side variation within them. For example, what I mean is white here, uh, you can only get to this gambit if white does not play the main moves, which are bishop to f4, something like knight to f3, one of these moves that defends this e-pawn, but rather you can only get to this gambit if white decides to play e4, which is the alakine variation of the Budapest gambit. And this is something that you might know a little bit less about, even if you are a Budapest gambiteer, because it is a much rarer variation. And the main idea here is that if black takes back, notice how your knight is attacked by this queen, and if black decides to take back on e5, which would be the typical response, the non-gambit response by black, white would be able to play a move like pawn to f4. This is the kind of thing that white is playing for. It's a very provocative style, where white is grabbing tons of space, kicking the knight back right away. As black, you can try to hope that you are, that white has overextended to some sort of degree, but objectively, this should work out well for white, or at least to say, uh, the computers will give white a rather substantial advantage in in a position like this. So instead of entering into all of this and allowing all of those complications, you have another option, and it's to play pawn to d6, which is known as the Balog Gambit. So this is a really fun one where you're sacrificing a pawn, and after bishop takes d6, you've actually set a very nasty trap with the black pieces, because if white's not careful here, black is just going to win as he did in this game, and it seems very likely that an opponent might come up with knight to f3. This is just the most natural move. You want to develop your knight, you get the knight into the game, and it looks like everything is going well, but no! White has actually fallen for a massive trap. Now, if you've seen any of my other videos, you might know, when you get this exact setup, it might appear that there's some sort of tactic involved with taking on f2. I think this is one of the first things that you might look for when you're looking for a tactic, but this knight takes f2 tactic just simply doesn't work. And the way that it might work, the way you might get tricked into thinking that you can do this is, aha, maybe I can get the king to this square, and then I can give this check with the bishop. I can play bishop to g3 in order to win this queen back, but you would be surprised if white doesn't take back your bishop, but instead bong clouds the king to e2, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, you're in a lot of trouble because white has just protected the queen, bishop's still hanging, and you've sacrificed a piece. This just simply does not work. So what is it? What is this deadly tactic black has available? And I will give you, this is your last chance maybe now to pause the video, but here in this game, uh, black actually played a very incredible move, Bishop to b4, moving the bishop for a second time. And what black is trying to do is he's trying to get white to block on d2 and temporarily make it impossible for this queen trade to happen, which might not be entirely obvious why you need to do that. And uh, we're going to show you the game, which was bishop to d2, and I'll show you exactly how black won on the very next move from this position. But it's also just worth pointing out that there exists all sorts of basic, ta basic tactics, like if knight to c3, uh, we can swap these guys and deliver this sort of fork. You know, this is one of the other main ideas available to black. But why, on the other hand, like, okay, I understand that, I can't play knight to c3. Why does it matter if I have to block with either a bishop or a knight on the d2 square? Well, now, black will move the bishop for a third time. And in this position, uh, white actually resigned the game because there's no satisfaction 
satisfactory way to defend this F2 pawn. And all of a sudden, white is just absolutely destroyed. Because if, for example, you play bishop to e3, which looks like the logical way, at least to try to defend and whatever, if we're losing a pawn, whatever, well, it actually gets very bad for you because we can swap these queens, we can swap these bishops, and at the end of the day, there's still this fork. So that's a very deadly trap that you can play. I just want to highlight it one more time. Uh, Balog Gambit against the Budapest. You can move your bishop three times and win the game immediately. Moving on to number two. This is uh, a game between Michael Bassman, who has got the uh, black pieces here. And this is a very dubious opening that you can play if you can get to this position, which is going to occur all the time. If your opponent plays e4 and you play the French defense, you're going to get to this position quite frequently. And already here, there is a very crazy gambit. And it's this move, pawn to b5. This is the Bowerly Gambit, a very hard word to pronounce. It's got four vowels right there stacked up in the middle. But it has this idea that after the bishop takes, and I do want to point out, this one is one of the ones on the very dubious side. This is maybe one you don't want to try at home, but it is head interesting idea to say the least. The point is you are now going to be playing bishop to b7, lining up your bishop on this diagonal and following it up with pawn to f5, uh, which doesn't really work, but in practice could be very dangerous. Now in this game, we saw the bishop did go back to d3 and black played pawn to f5. And this is kind of the main idea. You're trying to provoke white to take here so that you can take this pawn. And it is worth pointing out that one of the most critical moves for white actually is to take this pawn and to sacrifice the rook on h1. Now in this game, we saw knight to d2. So we're gonna see what happens if uh, people are deciding to defend this e pawn, which might happen quite frequently. But it is actually worth pointing out that a critical line is to take. And this leads to all sorts of crazy wild stuff where it actually is very hard for white to play like a computer. White plays like a computer, they win, but it could be difficult depending on your rate level. Now, after the bishop takes back on g2, just to kind of point out how fun this could get, uh, you might get something like this, where the queen is delivering this check. You got to play a move like g6. You got to get out of check. Okay, white is going to take here, and suddenly white is making a very large threat. And the threat is uh, pawn to g7, check, and winning the rook while making another queen. So something like knight to f6 just isn't going to work, even if you win this queen. Uh, he's getting a new queen while also taking the rook. But that's not the end of the story, because black has an interesting move. How do you prevent white from playing bishop to g7? Or, sorry, pawn to g7. Okay, I spoiled it. You play bishop to g7, and in this case, white is still able to take this h-pawn and deliver a check this way, and you will play king to f8. And now, this is kind of the interesting part of this position, because uh, if you ask a computer... It's going to give you some random move. It's going to be like, develop a piece. You know, make some sort of any random developing move, and you're like plus three, which is really cool. Like, white is obviously super winning. But yet, I think very many people would take this knight. How can you resist taking the knight, making a queen, winning some more material? But if you get to a position like this, the advantage is not quite as clear, although white should probably be doing very well here, because now all of a sudden, material is equal. But uh, obviously, you're playing with a little bit of fire if you decide to play this with black, because... Okay, I mean, come on, every human's going to take that knight. If you've never seen this before, it's really hard to resist taking the knight. But if they just develop, you're in really bad shape. This opening is to be avoided. But in this game, we saw an example of it going incredibly well because the opponent never took on f5 and instead decided uh, to just keep over fortifying this square. Now, uh, it gets attacked again. White defends it again. And now... How is black going to continue? We've put as much pressure on the e-pawn as possible, and you really want to continue putting pressure on the center. So what is black going to do? He played pawn to c5. <laughs> he says, all right, you protected this guy, no problem. I'm going to attack the other guy. And he had a very interesting point behind it, because after knight to f3, white, every single move, white is just defending the thing that black just attacked. Here, black played c4. <laughs> this is kind of a funny move. And he's saying one of these pieces now needs to take and you're going to have to undefend the e4 pawn. So after uh, bishop takes c4, we saw f takes. And now I do need to warn you that this game ends rather anticlimactically. And I just wanted to point that out because after knight to g5, we saw queen to a5. And uh, obviously black has made a very sneaky long ranged threat in this position, but the opponent didn't see it at this moment. Black, er, sorry, white is still doing very well. But after c3, uh, Oh, the knight fell off a super long queen maneuver. And that's why white is a no name. Again, I would say maybe avoid this gambit, but it does have kind of an interesting idea behind it. Now, moving on from that, 
we will get a little bit of redemption by showing an opening that actually is potentially very playable. And this one was played not between two no-names, but rather two very high-rated players. So the player with the white is a 24-65 rated Fide player, and uh, the other opponent is 25-20. So these are two very good players playing a very respectable opening. This is the Rosalimo variation of the Sicilian. You're going to get this all the time. But the reason you might not know this particular gambit is because it only occurs in this one peculiar line uh, with knight going to a5. And this is not the most common way, but it is a very interesting approach by Black who is just moving the knight. White's intention is very often to take that knight. So if I move it out of the way, you can't capture me. And maybe I'll be expanding on the queen side. I'll play a6 and b5, and you're going to have to move your bishop yet again. So a very fascinating idea that does allow white to play a very interesting gambit. And this one is the San Francisco gambit. You can play pawn to b4. And you're kind of combining the Rosalimo with some sort of wing gambit. It, it leads to kind of some interesting ideas. And in this game, we did not see black take the gambit, which is going to happen quite a lot when you're looking at high-leveled games. And this was the highest model game I could find in this one particular opening, which is something I'm trying to do. I'm trying to find the highest rated players to play these particular openings. Uh, in this game, we saw black not immediately take. And I just want to point out, if they do decide to take... You can play it just like it's a wing gambit. You can play d4 at some point, a3. Black is probably playing uh, e6 and a6 in some sort of move order. You're going to get something like this, where you can just continue and you can just castle, or you can play a3, something like this. And uh, this it's kind of an interesting gambit because you're you are going to be down a pawn like if black ever takes this you're going to be down a pawn but at the same time knight doesn't necessarily make sense over on a5 and you have the center already with white but you know it's probably like around equal due to everything that's kind of going on so that's sort of something that you might be able to get and this might actually very well be a playable gambit however in this game we saw a6 and unlike the rest of these games that are kind of miniatures this one is just a, a well played game for the most part now uh another interesting choice by white you might expect this bishop to just move somewhere well it went somewhere but it went to d7 and it took this guy and temporarily white goes up a pawn <laughs> he takes the pawn on d7 he takes back right here this pawn is eventually going to be recaptured by the queen, but we get to sort of an interesting middle game position where at some point uh, it becomes a question of where is black actually going to castle? Are you going to castle on the queen side where maybe I can do stuff on the B file? Are you going to castle on the king side where maybe it's not super easy to get a, a lot of defenders over there? Let's see where he decides to end up going. Black does decide to go on the queen side and we get some sort of interesting position like this. Uh, this knight gets attacked twice. It's attacked by the bishop and the queen now. It's defended by by knight to g5, allowing this queen to come in. And we see kind of a lot of interesting intermezzos in this game altogether. Knight goes back, defends the f7 pawn. Uh, up comes the rook. The rook might be thinking of swinging all the way over and then maybe at some day settling on the b3 square. Uh, the knight gets attacked. The rook does kick the queen away. And then at some point, uh, everything's getting kicked away. Black is setting up all sorts of nasty stuff against g2. So white kicks the queen away, uh, moves the queen out. And after this recapture, instead of taking back right away, another nice little in-between move delivers this check, takes back the bishop. And so far, we just have a relatively nice game, maybe a little bit better for uh white this entire time but at some moment we get to this position and white decides to grab on c5 and this is kind of the critical moment of the game because the queen ends up in the alignment of the rook so black decides to take this time to play bishop takes g2 and this is where probably a lot of calculation had to come into play and the question is uh do we just need to like move our queen somewhere and allow this bishop to be able to retreat and Black has just took uh, a very strong pawn in front of our king. Well, actually, white comes up with this move. Pawn to e6. And the idea is you've created a square for this queen to be able to get out of the way with check and then potentially to be able to recover this bishop. So black decides to take the queen, but now white has to take this queen. And suddenly black is in a lot of trouble because this bishop needs to go somewhere, but there actually is not a good square. And the game he decides to go to h3, which allows pawn to d4. And all of a sudden, uh oh, two things are under attack, but there's really nothing better. Like, for example, if you go here, it might even be worse for black because boom bishop to d4 and all of a sudden this rook is just completely trapped so something like this doesn't quite work and instead what we saw was 
the bishop just going to h3, and this allowed white to win a piece. Now, I don't want to say that this game was won purely because of the opening, but the opening itself does seem to be playable. The San Francisco Gambit. It's kind of a cool one if you ever get this really rare variation of the Rosalimo with knight to a5. Consider b4 as kind of a cool, interesting gambit. Now, moving on to what is probably the most dubious gambit on this list, we got number two, the game between a grandmaster who got absolutely crushed by one of the worst gambits of all time. This is uh, Julian Hodgson, Grandmaster, 2560 rated player. He was playing in a simul against somebody I cannot find any information about. And this was an English opening where after knight to c3, knight f6, knight f3, we get sort of the three knights variation. We see pawn to e4, knight to g5. And in this position, there actually are quite a lot of different gambits that you can play. Like b5 directly is uh, one very interesting gambit. c6 is a very interesting gambit. This kind of been played a little bit more frequently lately. The idea is you can sort of do some swap and you can play d5 and you can force this knight to pick a direction. And this has led to some very interesting games, some of which have been covered on this channel. But instead of that, we saw this insanely rare and incredibly dumb, horrible knight to g4. This one is really bad. You ask your computer, it's already like plus three. Like literally one of the worst moves you could ever play, aka the Urbanheimer Gambit. <laughs> this is one I'd never heard of. And probably for good reason. There's just no reason to play this. But yet a Grandmaster got absolutely crushed in just a couple moves from this position. So white takes back right here. Black needs to follow this up with something direct. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but any position where you have a knight aimed at this F2 pawn always could end up being more dangerous than it first appears. And in fact, Black plays pawn to F5, kicks this knight away, and now follows it up with queen to h4, keeping an eye on this f2 pawn. The queen and knight are converging on that pawn. And uh, white just needs to be a little bit careful to avoid any mistakes and should be able to pretty easily win this game. But yet, we see first knight to d5. White is going here, trying to fork black. So black decides to use the king. Why not? King to d8. But now we see this horrible move, pawn to h3. And this is the losing move by white. What white needs to do is just move this e pawn, uh, e3 or even e4 is a computer suggestion. But e3 is like safe and sensible enough. d4 is also fine. Like literally any move that's not h3 and white is fine. But now you're in a lot of trouble. And the winning move for black is knight takes f2. And after the king takes back, we can notice that the king is now stuck in this horrible pin. And all you need to do is attack the pin piece one more time with bishop to d6. And uh oh, white is suddenly busted. And even here, white probably can play a little bit better, but he unfortunately plays pawn to e3, which looks like maybe you've given the king a little bit of space to run away after this capture. But all of a sudden you might realize after bishop takes on g3, no matter where this king goes, if you decide to get on this diagonal, you're going to be hit with this move. And suddenly you're going to be losing the queen. So after the king runs away, wherever he decides to go, uh oh, there goes the queen. So this was a absolutely huge mistake made even worse by running into the corner. And now it's actually just a very simple mate and two bishop to F2 and queen to G3. So I don't know what to make of this one. It's probably the worst gambit on the list, at least in terms of stockfish rating, but knight to G4 play at your own risk. Definitely probably one to avoid, but maybe you can trap a grandmaster. Who knows? Now we're moving on to number one. This is uh, another gambit that probably has the coolest name. This is the Pickler Gambit, named after Gary Pickler himself. I found one of his original games, and this is something that occurs in uh, the Queen, uh, sorry, the King's Gambit. And it starts with the Folkbeer Counter Gambits. Now what's cool about this is that now, okay, here's one gambit, the Falk Bear Counter Gambit. And after this takes, some people here, okay, most people here are playing E4. There's also some rare move of taking. But this move is not necessarily completely unknown. This is like the Nimzovich Gambit within the Falk Bear Counter Gambit. Pawn to C6. Even this is still a gambit. But now after this recapture, you can play the Pickler Gambit, which uh, instead of recapturing, which almost always happens, everybody takes back on C6, you can play... Bishop to c5, <laughs> sacrificing another pawn. And what's cool about this is the computer evaluation is something like plus 0.8, like a little bit better for white. But if this is only a little bit better, you've sacked two pawns already. 
Uh, this could be something that's very dangerous because White's moved this F pawn. This gives us some ideas in the future of potentially giving this check, especially if White White can never take this E5 pawn because there's always going to be this check. And who knows? Maybe at some point we can come in. Maybe at some point we can just recapture this pawn. It looks like it could be very fun. Now, I have to warn you in advance. I'm not sure that this was necessarily the highest quality game. I'm not sure the ratings of Mr. Pickler, but his opening idea is truly a fantastic one. Knight to f3 is the move that makes a lot of sense. White puts more pressure on this pawn and needs to prevent the queen from going out to h4. Uh, and instead of perhaps taking back on c6, his idea was to, boom, push this pawn to e4. And uh, you're basically playing a folk bear counter gambit, but you got this bishop out, which is very useful in fact. So here we saw knight takes back. Uh, bishop to C, uh, B5 and putting pressure on the C6 square. And this is where things begin to get very interesting. Because in this game, we saw Queen to B6, maybe not the worst move in the world, attacking this Bishop and trying to put a little bit of pressure on the F2 square. Maybe Bishop F2 is coming. But it is worth pointing out here, there is an interesting computer idea of just playing Knight to F6. And if White gets greedy and decides to try to take this Knight, you would expect maybe Knight takes is the way to do it. You get to this very interesting position where you can take this knight back and if this recapture bishop to d7 and you've set a beautiful trap because if white gets altered greedy and decides to go for this rook and i will tell you in the lee chess database this position has occurred eight times and all eight players have grabbed this rook but now all of a sudden black is just completely winning and hopefully you can spot the winning move Bishop to g4! The queen is trapped! <laughs> it's actually a brilliant idea. So this Pickler Gambit is a really cool one. Uh, could lead to a trap like this. But that's not what happened in our game. In our game, we got the Pickler Gambit. Uh, but instead of knight to f6, which could be an interesting trapping move, we saw queen to b6, after, we, ah, after which we spoiled the game. But to come back to it one more time, uh, we get to this position where black is able to recapture. So now we're really, really down one pawn. And we have this very dangerous alignment of the queen and the bishop. Queen comes out to e2, defends the square, potentially attacks this pawn. And uh, here we see knight to f6, knight comes in, bishop to a3, a6, sorry. This all makes a lot of sense. At some point, things stopped making sense. Um, this move makes some sense, but it's actually like losing black and castle here. And it's like a very strong move. But instead, he opens up this file. Uh, oh, things are looking very dangerous. But then instead of taking back with a knight, white takes back with a pawn. And this allows black to get castled. And all of a sudden, black is back in charge. And this game went rook to e8 uh, here, attacking the queen. But this is not necessarily the best move because of this exact move. Well spotted by Mr. Pickler. Queen to d4. Very strong move attacking this guy. And uh, all of a sudden, this guy's pinned. So this pawn is kind of hanging, which is the defender of this guy. Things are slowly starting to unravel. Uh, let's also mention that maybe the d3 square is a little sensitive. So he decides to get castled, which allows black to sneak in with the queen. And white is just in a lot of trouble here. So this is how uh, Gary Pickler himself was able to win a game of chess. Um, very well done to Gary. And hopefully you enjoyed it. And maybe you would play the Pickler Gambits. I think of all of them, this maybe is the one that I would pick up and maybe play the most. It's kind of an interesting one. And that's five Gambits that you probably don't know. Please subscribe, please. It helps me out so much. Bye!